Hello and welcome to our lecture number five and here we're going to start getting into the details of the IPOP architecture uh, but before getting into that I wanted to give a perspective of how does IPOP look like from the application standpoint and from a user standpoint. So IPOP begins with a network interface that allows a computer to connect to the virtual network and it then takes packets out of this network interface and creates peer-to-peer -peer tunnels connecting uh, to another computer on the other side of the internet. It allows this virtual network interface to have virtual private addresses to be assigned and also implements the possible, uh, a possibility of matching, uh, sorry, mapping IP addresses in the process of moving uh, from one endpoint to the next. So one example of a user view of IPOP is group VPN and this is akin to a private cluster so every node uh, for example would have an IP address on a subnet and all the nodes would be able to communicate with all other nodes in the group VPN using a unique address that's not translated or not mapped. Another example is social VPN where there's no single address space for all the nodes actually every user has their own uh, address space uh, of their friends and they map devices of their friends to dynamic IP addresses that are assigned uh, and bound to a local uh, virtual private subnet. We're going to go into the details of these two uh, uh, implementations of IPOP at a later um, module. How does an application perceive IPOP? For example, a web server or a web browser. Essentially, the applications are not aware that they're communicating using IPOP. They're communicating as if they were using the Internet. They're just using a different interface. So the applications will use addresses that are and open sockets on this virtual network interface. But once they do that, they'll be able to communicate without any changes as if they were communicating over the Internet. So in this diagram, we have an application like a web client opens a socket, let's say, for a server listening on this address and starts sending HTTP requests to the server. Nothing changes from the client perspective or the server perspective. This could be Apache, this could be uh, Firefox. What changes is that they're using names on the virtual network. And this is using a virtual network interface. We'll see uh, one example is a tap device that has an address on the IPOP namespace. And we have one of each on the computer on the left-hand side and one on the computer on the right-hand side. IPOP itself is a program that's running on both of these endpoints that's able to take packets out of this uh, network interface and encapsulate, encrypt, and forward them through tunnels over the internet. So that goes through the physical network, through a physical network interface like an Ethernet card or a Wi-Fi interface. That goes through the internet and reaches the other destination. So IPUP does all the packet handling that's needed to make this whole process transparent to the client and the server that they're actually communicating over the internet. It looks like they're communicating as if they were part of the same local air network. So that requires this uh, net virtual network interface and again we use a device uh, such as a tap device that's available uh, from uh, many operating systems and that looks like your computer has just added a new network interface card uh, but this network interface is special in that instead of sending a message over a physical network like a physical network interface does it's going to take a message and forward it to IPOP and IPOP will emulate the behavior of that network for for us so IPOP works on private address uh, spaces, for example, for IPv4 that includes the 10 dot or the 192.168 or the 172.16 address spaces. IPv6 is also supported by IPOP and IPv6 has a larger uh, range of private addresses. So applications can use IPOP with whatever protocol is layered on top of IP. That could be TCP or EDP or typical uh, cases. IPOP itself, we use um, internet protocol and protocols on top of IP to communicate over the physical network.
Typically, IPOP uses UDP, the reason uh, being that UDP with UDP is easier to do net traversal, and we'll see uh, that in more depth in a later um, um, slide. But to map this, to this back to this example, this tunnel here between the physical network interface, typically done over UDP for uh, net traversal, but the client and the server that are using IPOP could use TCP or EDP or any other protocol layered on top of IP. Now, IP addresses may require translation. Again, as I mentioned, IPv4 is running out of IP addresses. Uh, if you wanted to give an IPv4 address to every user on Facebook, for example, you will not be able to map all these addresses to the private address space that I described earlier. So IPOP allows us to map IP addresses to sidestep some of these uh, limitations, and I'll describe this later when we get into social VPN, which is one of the uh, VPNs built on top of IPOP. And another question that I didn't address yet is, in this example, it's assumed that these two endpoints want to talk to each other, but somebody has to tell two nodes that they should talk to each other. IPOP uses a social network backend and the XMPP protocol to establish and discover which devices should communicate with which other devices. So that can be a public service like uh, a public XMPP service from Google or it could be your own uh, online social network uh, of sorts. For example, an XMPP server that uses the eJabberD uh, open source uh, XMPP service. So the idea is, if you have multiple users here, let's say Alice, Bob, Carol, and David, in the XMPP server, you would do operations that manage who connects to whom. So Alice will use a web browser or an XMPP client to befriend Bob, and Bob will also use a client to befriend Alice on the server. Once that's done, they can use the server to establish a VPN connection that will be directly between them. Or alternatively, we can also create groups. Uh, so Carol can create a group, and David and other users may join Carol's group as defined by the server. And again, eventually, these relationships are used to establish the peer-to-peer -peer connections between the computers that David owns and the computers that Carol owns. So here's a screenshot of an interface uh, of the eJabberD uh, system and, and basically it allows you to create users like Alice, Bob, and Carol and de define which users are connected to which other users. So you can build your own customized online social network in this way. There's also ways for us to connect to existing uh, social networks. For example, through XMPP uh, we can tie into Google accounts using um, IPOP. You just need to point to the right online social network service that supports the XMPP protocol uh, in order to get started. 